purity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Because it teaches us about the will of your son. Please help us, Father, to honor the one who is seated at the right hand. And God, in this immoral, fallen Sodom and Gomorrah in which we live. Oh, God, help us to be pure. And to walk with purity, to speak with purity, to be fearful of the flesh. Oh, dear God, help us. And as the hymn writer said, Lord, never, ever let us outlive our love for thee. Lord, keep us, protect us. We're in a world as though a man were in the Amazon surrounded by piranhas, oh God. We need you, we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verse two, he says, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. Now he uses the word sisters here, the feminine, of course, of, of brothers in this case, Adelphas. And I, I, I've just written here, this designation denotes love, loving our sisters, fellowship, fellowship with our sisters, partnership, which brings out more of the meaning of koinonia in that working together with our sisters. And then even an intimate relationship, but without sexual overtones. Um, I have two sisters. One has gone home to be with the Lord. And I loved her very much. She was very close to me. I have another sister who uh, is a brilliant, funny lady. And uh, she lives a long way from me, but I love her very much. And so we can say that we have an intimate relationship, but there is, there are no, of course, sexual overtones. The idea is that the relationship is marked with purity. Now, I want to look at some general principles to begin with. And first of all, they're the same principles of which we have already spoken. Uh, Matthew 23, 8. Do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Then there was Matthew 18, where we talked about we never leave the, uh, the title of child. So we are brothers and sisters with those women who have become Christians. We are, we are brother and sister relationship. They are children of God. And that word means more than just adoption. It's the whole word designates absolute dependence upon God as they are absolutely dependent on God. We are absolutely dependent upon God. And also, as we saw in Ephesians 18 through 5, 18 through 21, there is a sense of mutual submission. You don't just speak to your sisters in Christ. You listen to your sisters in Christ. Uh, one of the things that has always been a pet peeve for me is that, well, we need to acknowledge this. Number one, there, there is diversity of roles. And that is very, very clear. And even though it goes against our culture and it goes against the nonsense in the world today, there's diversity of roles. Um, there are things that men have been called to do exclusively. So 1 Timothy 2.12, we must always honor. Um, yet at the same time, what I want you to see is that women were created equally as men in the image of God. In the image of God, he created them man and woman. And so what does that mean? Although there's, although there's diversity of roles, men and women grow the same way. Did you know that? Theology, doctrine, profound truth, prayer. To exclude women from the teaching of theology is absolutely barbaric, unbiblical. 
Uh, it, it's always grieved me that sometimes men get together and they have these conferences on justification, eschatology, ecclesiology, sanctification, the doctrine of Christ. Then you see these women conferences where it's like something, the title of it would be, if the world gives you lemons, learn how to make lemonade. That's not what women need, and that's an insult. Women need the same theology as men to grow. Women can know theology deeply and can contribute to the conversation, the theological conversation. And I think that is very, very important. And so be very, very careful of, of uh, the way you, you look at things. It seems to me that on one side there's a, almost a barbaric Neanderthalism, if you can make up a word, and on the other side is liberalism that denies the Scripture, and we want to avoid both of those. We want to maintain what Scripture says with regard to the difference between a man and a woman and the different roles of a man and a woman in the church and in the family. Yet at the same time, fully recognize total equality and especially that we grow the same way through learning truth. Truth that is born into our hearts and our minds through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, so the same general principles that apply to our um, relationship with our brothers in Christ also apply to our scripture, to our sisters. But here he adds something else. He says, in all purity. Now notice, he doesn't say that with brothers. He doesn't say, you know, uh, appeal to the younger men as brothers in all purity. Right? Why? I mean, today you would say, well, maybe he ought to put that in. Well, uh, need to be very careful here. Paul said, such were some of you. But the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit changed that. And we need to be very, very clear on that matter. And so here we notice there's a distinction. There is a warning because there is a danger that occurs here that should not occur with our brothers. And what is that? the possibility of physical attraction. And so he adds an important element of caution. As with brothers, we're being warned here not to be arrogant, not to be overbearing, but with, si with sisters, there is an added warning because of the risk of immorality. And if not immorality, of creating affections in a person that should not be there. And this is something that I think a lot of ministers have run into foolishly because they do not practice enough caution. Now, you can tell me that you love your wife. You can tell me that um, that you have no desire. You can tell me that all your um, affections are pure. Wonderful. That still does not mean that you should not put parameters around you. Around you, around your actions, around your location, around your speech, be very, very careful, especially when you're dealing with someone who comes to you and they are hurting. And you come to them with truth, with kindness, with mercy, with understanding, and that in itself is wonderful, but it can also create. It can create a link, a relationship that can be quite dangerous. And history proves me out on this. So when it comes to dealing with your sisters, you must honor them. You must respect them. You must speak to them. You must listen to them. And that means even learn from them. But you must be Guarded. Now, if we go back to Galatians 6, 1, it takes on new meaning. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So you're brought into a situation in which you must appeal to a sister in Christ. You need to already have formulated 
parameters to protect you and to protect her. You should not be meeting all the time. You should not be meeting behind closed doors. You should be counseling with another person, possibly. You should involve wise women, possibly, in the congregation. All these decisions require wisdom. But know this, you should not only walk in the fear of the Lord and not only walk in the fear of what the devil can do, you should walk in the fear of you. And that's why he adds here all purity. The word denotes cleanliness especially moral and sexual purity, chastity. Now, he says in all purity, and I think this is very, very important. He says in all purity, and I've written here, let your purity be through and through in every interaction with your sisters in Christ. Let purity be the outstanding characteristic of your fellowship with them. Be very careful here, brothers, very careful, because there are a lot of hurting people who can become attracted to a person who takes note of their hurt, ministers to it and helps them. An emotional relationship can be created. That should not be. Now, one thing I want you to know, the ministry is no place for a narcissist. What do I mean by that? Someone who wants to be the hero for everybody. You are no hero. You were never intended to be a hero, and especially for your sisters in Christ, you are to be no hero. You are to point them to the hero. And you should not be going ever to the daughters of other men and say, if you have a problem, come talk to me. Or to the wives of other men, if you have a problem with your husband, come talk to me. I know that sounds grotesque and I hate to bring it up, but there are men like that. They may not even be immoral men. They just want to be the hero in the story. You are not to be the hero in the story. You are not to be the go to guy. You're not to be the solver of every problem. You're not to take the place of other authorities that have been laid down. You are to point people to Christ. And away from yourself. And if you have a church where people are growing in their need of you, you're doing something terribly wrong. Something terribly wrong. As people grow in maturity, they should need less of you because they have more of Christ. Be very, very careful of subverting relationships, of subverting other authorities, as bec of becoming the prominent person in someone's life. Don't do that. You're on the way to a cult. And if I seem adamant about it, it's because in 40 years I've seen a lot of this. Your desire should be not that they need more of you, but that they need less of you. That they become independent of you because of their great dependence upon Christ. It's very important, very important. Do not become anyone's hero. Now, um, I want to read this again in all purity. Let your purity be through and through in every interaction with your sisters. Let purity be the outstanding characteristic of your fellowship with them and build parameters. Don't expect someone else to build the parameters. You build the parameters. Be very, very careful how you counsel. Be very, very careful with regard to your distance, your location. More than an open door in your office. Be very careful here. The same applies. I have met because there are so few fathers today. I've met young men who will they'll come around another leader who's not their father because they're looking for a hero. They're looking for a father 
And it's easy for someone to take advantage of that. But what you want to do is to teach those young men to stand alone with Christ, not to depend upon you. Teach the young women to stand alone with Christ. They have a strength to them. You do not want yourself to become the center of their world. If everything's about the pastor more than everything's about Christ, there's a problem. And, and beware of this, brethren. And the more authority you seem to have in the pulpit, the more the more gifted you are at counseling, the more sure you are, the more danger you're in. So really make purity the mark. Now, I, I want to read one other text here that's important, and that is uh, Ephesians three, uh, five, verse three through five. But immorality or any impurity, that's uncleanliness, referring primarily to moral or sexual uncleanliness. He goes, but immorality or any impurity or greed, greed has a lot to do with immorality, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Many men have been trapped by their speech. Many men have been trapped by texting. I say trapped, not as a victim. They fell into it. Be very, very careful. Make sure that your fellowship with your wife is very strong. When people talk about, you know, I have men come up to me and they'll say, well, you know, how do I guard myself? from sexual immorality, adultery, things like that. And they're always thinking about, you know, how do they build a guard or build a parameter or avoid something? And, and all that's important. But here's something they often neglect, and that's Proverbs, where we're to delight in the wife of our youth. If you want to guard yourself, and if your wife wants to help you guard you from any sort of taint, when it comes to immorality, then the thing to do is cultivate your relationship. Your personal relationship, your friendship and your intimate relationship. It's one of the reasons why it's very important also for you both to, to physically take care of yourself. To present the best man you can to your wife and your wife present the best woman she can to you. And to cultivate that relationship, because if you're delighting in your wife, you're a long way into being protected. A long way. If you're satisfied with her and she's satisfied with you. Now, I want to go on and we're going to mention one other thing that uh, is extremely important here. And that's this. Now, write this down. The purity of a minister's conduct is how he gains or loses respect in the congregation. I have known men who were not powerful preachers and they were, didn't have that great a clarity in teaching. But their purity, their conformity to Christ won the day. I can name to you several men now in my 40 years that I knew that when I think of them, I don't even think about their preaching. I don't even hardly remember their teaching, but boy, do I remember their life. Boy, do I remember their life. Purity, godliness, Christ likeness. So I want you to look for a, a moment at uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. See if we have time here. Yes, 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one look down on your youthfulness. Now that doesn't mean you're supposed to walk around and say, don't look down on me. Don't look down on me. Or I deserve more respect. Or you need to respect me. That's not, that's not the way you do it. It says, let no one look down on your youthfulness. Well, how can you do that? But rather in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe or possibly show yourself an example to those who believe. 
But look at one of the qualities. It's purity. How do you gain respect? Purity. How do you show that you're truly a man of God? Everybody knows that a, that a snake can preach. Everybody knows that a snake can have a wonderful personality. Everybody knows that a wolf knows the right words. But purity, purity, now that's another thing. And if you want to gain respect in the congregation, you do so by purity. Now, let's go for just a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, Paul is commending his ministry. He's saying, I'm the real deal. And look in verse 3. Giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God. Now, how does he commend himself as a servant of God? Does he do it through personality, preaching, prosperity, ingenuity, brilliance? How does he do it? No, he says in much endurance, in affliction, in hardship, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, in hunger. You know, one of the arguments uh, for the validity, historical validity of the resurrection. It must be true. Because if it was false, those, those 12 apostles, if you include Paul, they would have said it was false pretty much right out of the gate. Because every one, history tells us, except John, died as a martyr. And John suffered horrifically if church tradition is true. So how do we prove that we're real? It's not by, uh, you know, coming into the ministry and prospering and and having a wonderful your best life now. That's not how you prove anything. But in spite of incredible difficulty, you persevere. You persevere. It must not be a lie. Paul comes in to Thessalonica already having suffered. Many scholars believe that when he arrived there at Thessalonica, when he talks about, you know, you took what we said as the very word of God, that what happened was he walked into the marketplace and he was beat all to pieces from the last town he was in. Bloody feet, swollen face, bruises all over his body, possibly lash marks. And he comes in and he starts preaching the very message that got him just beat to pieces. And the people are looking at that thinking, man, there's got to be something to this. No one. All these other charlatans that come and speak with great eloquence in order to get money and to prosper. Here's this man everywhere he goes. He's treated like he's the enemy of the world and he doesn't deserve to live. And and they beat him and they, they, they whip him and they mock him. They put him in stocks and he just keeps going. That's what shows validity, not your prosperity. It's your suffering. And then he goes on, he goes in verse five, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, in hunger. And then he goes in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. Notice he puts purity before knowledge. Many of you are seeking to be really good theologians, and that's wonderful. But I've never met a good theologian who's lived up to his theology. And that's not because we're hypocrites. It's just that theology is pretty high. Those demands are pretty high. The true test is not knowledge. The true test is purity. Now, to get to purity, you need knowledge. Christianity is not less than doctrine, but it is more than doctrine. 
I mean, I can pretty much probably, I've never tried it, but I could probably get a parrot to read John Flavel and John Owen and Charles Spurgeon. You can get an AI machine to mock the greatest preachers in the world, to imitate them perfectly. But you can't get purity out of them. Purity. And especially around the daughters of God and the daughters of men. Just think about that for a moment. Do any of you have daughters? I do. Brother Paul, what would you do if I hurt your daughter? You don't want to know. And if I, being evil, could love my daughters that way, cut off my arm, throw myself in front of a train, anything it takes to protect those two little girls. You say, well, one of them's a little bit older. No, they're always little girls to their dad. If I would be willing to do anything, anything, absolutely anything for them and me being evil, how much more does my heavenly father care about his daughters? He says a millstone tied around your neck if you cause one of the least of these little ones to stumble. But I'm, I would imagine then it, when it comes to girls, maybe it's two millstones. Purity. That's the key. Your holiness. Guys, look at the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. That right there is proof. There are men that are not as godly as other men. I'm not talking about hypocrites, but there are men who are not as godly as others, and yet they preach with great power. God has endued them to preach with great power. And that's wonderful. But the true test is not even that you can preach with great power and souls are saved. The true test is the fruit of the Spirit. And, and you need to know that. You need desperately to know that. Mark that. Put it on your wall. Make that the standard. Am I this? Am I this consistently? Am I becoming more consistent in this? And throw purity in there while you're at it. Without holiness, without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. You see? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word, but I pray, O oh God, for everyone who would watch this video. O oh God, raise up young preachers, God, young pastors that are pure. Lord, enough of this nonsense of just all the nonsense that's out there, the antinomianism and the flaunting liberty Oh God, raise up pure men, pure men who fear you. Men who do not run from sin simply because they're disciplined, but because they hate it. Men that have your character, Lord, please keep us. And those